Welcome to our second lesson in our Introduction to Material Processing course, Part 3. In this lesson, we're focusing on four key variables, temperature, pressure, environment, and time, and seeing how they impact our material processing. This video, we're focusing on environment. Now, what do I mean when I say environment? The definition of the word environment, according to Merriam-Webster, are the circumstances, objects, and conditions that one is surrounded by. So, in the case of materials during processing, I'm interested in what is surrounding my material. Now, in our first lesson, we said that many processing techniques are used to alter a material's shape. Well, how can the environment help us do that? One way to do this is by considering the chemical environment which surrounds our material. Often, when we're talking about environment, we're talking about the chemical environment. Chemical etching is a way to do this. This has been used for centuries to create decorative patterns on objects made out of glass, metal, and polymers. The process is fairly straightforward. Simply mask off what parts of your product you do not want etched and dip them into some etchant. Usually this is a type of acid, sulfuric, nitric, hydrochloric, even hydrofluoric in the case of glasses. Then, you simply rinse off the etchant after some length of time, and boom, you have your decorative pattern. Now, we've gotten really good at removing material using chemical etchant. We're so good at it, in fact, that we can make very small structures. Think tens of nanometers. These techniques have paved the way for the silicon age, allowing us to create small structures out of semiconductors for our many electronic devices. Now, a challenge when trying to make patterns this small using chemical etching is, what do we use as our mask or pattern? There are many different techniques to do this, one of which is photolithography. Photolithography is a technique that highlights another element of the environment we can control during processing that you may not have thought of, and that's the exposure to ultraviolet light or UV. Let's say I have my material I want to chemically etch, a silicon wafer, here. After my wafer is clean and an adhesion promoter is applied, I'll apply a layer of a polymer called a photoresist to this surface. My photoresist can be cross-linked by UV light. So, if I, using a mask of some design, expose only some portions of this photoresist layer to UV, I'm left with a polymer layer with some portions that are cross-linked and some that aren't. After this, I can develop my photoresist using a specific chemical solution, which will leave behind my cross-linked pattern. To ensure this pattern is secure, my photoresist is hard baked in an oven. Then this pattern can be used for my etching processes. Now there are many more specifics to photolithography, but the general steps are there, showcasing how we use both UV and chemical environments to create these photoresist masks. Now our environment isn't always used to remove material. It can be used to add material as well. Electrodeposition, also called electroplating sometimes, can be used to coat a metallic part with another metallic film. To do this, we submerge our part, acting as the cathode in this situation, into an electrolyte bath. The material we want to deposit on the surface is our anode. If we connect our cathode and anode by a direct electric current, we allow the ions from our anode to deposit themselves onto the surface of our cathode. In order to get a high quality film, we need to be careful of the composition of the anode and the electrolyte bath. Trying to deposit metal onto something that's not conductive? No problem. Electroless plating does not use any electricity and instead relies on a chemical reaction where we're depositing metal onto the catalytic surface of our part using a chemical reduction reaction. This is all thanks due to the chemical composition of the plating bath. Before we wrap up our discussion, I want to highlight one more element of environment, and that is the atmosphere our parts are in. No, I'm not talking about atmospheric pressure. I talked about that in the last video. Instead, I'm talking about the chemical composition of the atmosphere that our part is experiencing. Some materials are very reactive to oxygen, so in order to process them, we might need to be in an inert atmosphere, such as nitrogen or argon gas. Other processes require very little atmosphere at all. Think of chemical vapor deposition, or CBD. 
This is a vapor-driven process, where our reactant is a gas, which settles on the surface of our parts and decomposes, leaving a film of material behind. If we were to try to do this process in a chamber that just has regular air, the air molecules themselves would disrupt the path of the gas reactant, therefore reducing the efficiency of our reaction. So instead, we pull vacuum on our CBD chambers, removing the air molecules, allowing the gas reactant to get where it needs to go. And with that, we'll wrap up our discussion about the impact environment has on processing. I hope I've been able to show how, by changing the environment that a material is experiencing during processing, we can have some pretty dramatic changes. Our last variable we're discussing is time. Now, time is everywhere in processing. You've probably noticed this in our past three videos. So we're going to spend a little bit of time highlighting some time-related concerns in part four. So stick around.